Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Dashi I Miller here from Warrior Concepts, but you know that already. Here we are with Kuden uh, episode, what are we, 204? 204, all right. So, um, so I, I, again, this is one of those uh, bricks in the block or bricks in the, in the wall or whatever that uh, I, I started a couple of episodes back uh, to help folks uh, just get the most out of their training, right? So, um, what we're going to focus on today is both a blessing and a curse, right? So here's the question, right? With all of the techniques, all the skills, all the lessons that we have in this system, and I, it's more than than a lot of people think about, and especially the kata collectors, right? Um, we have to remember that this system, right? Bujinkan, Ninjutsu, whatever you want to call it, right? Is made up of dozens of lineages, right? Dozens, not just the nine schools that people uh, like to focus on, right? And while that's great, because we have, I mean, literally, we have more options than anybody taking a single lineage or mixing two or three together or whatever, right? There's also a major problem with this, right? So I'm going to talk about that and how to solve it when we get back. The big question is this, how are self-defense and success-minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kudan Radio. Real training for real people in a real world. All right. Well, that was a weird glitch. James, did you see that on your end, or was I the only one looking at a blank screen? No, you saw a blank screen as well? Very weird. All right. Anyway, all right. So um, now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to, I don't know, splice it in or whatever at some point. Anyway, all right. So uh, again, Right. Uh, for those of you who were on at the very beginning, right, I'm talking about uh, th this this problem that can happen. Right, we've got all of these techniques, all these skills, all these lessons, right, and just across nine schools, let alone the dozens that Hatsumi Sensei had uh, Menkyo Kaiden in. Right. So not just we're not just talking about nine schools. Right. When people focus on the nine schools, they're focusing on nine schools that he had Soke ship of right before he met takama sensei he had menkyo kaiden in how many right we'll name a couple of them tonight but it's just it's the, the list is overwhelming right um and so all of those play an influence in into what we're doing right so uh you know when we think about all this stuff right we've got how many come I, right? Well, in, in our curriculum between white belt and Shodan, a student has 15, 19, 20 or 21 come I, right? Um, we've got how many different ways to strike, how many different ways to do uke in the gosh, right? Kicking methods, um, uh, wrist reversals, all that kind of stuff, right? We're not just a punching or kicking uh quote unquote style. And I hate that term. We're not just a grappling style. We're not just you know, whatever. Right. So we've got, you know, all of these skills, all the weapons, uh, stealth, wilderness survival. I know lots of people aren't doing all of these things, but this is what's included. Right. Um, we've got the nine schools, right. Togaku Ryu, uh, Gyokushin Ryu, uh, Kumugaku Ryu, uh, Ninpo, right? Then we've got Gyoko Ryu, Koto Ryu, Tagagi Yoshi Ryu, Kukushin Dao Ryu, uh, what? Gika Ryu. You get the idea, right? Um, and then we have these Koryu and other connections, right? Um, some Hazmi Sitsei picked up along the way or integrated with what we're doing, but none of our past masters had soke ship of right like the musashi view right and then we had other schools that were direct connections because they got absorbed into right like in the kukishindo you uh there's the ito school right the ito to you right it's one of these code you right one of these older schools again there's there's 
dozens and dozens of others um, that there's influence. And this is not even to mention, right, uh, Mikio and uh, a lot of the philosophical uh, input uh, and things like that from different things, right? Um, I, as a matter of fact, just before we went live, well, hour or three before we went live, uh, I sent out an email that highlighted hidden lessons, right? And so all the things I just mentioned, whether or not you know what school it came from, whether you know whether or not you know that uh, our knife and Kasari stuff, whether well, knife stuff came from the Musashi school, the Kasari stuff came from the Manriki school, whether you know those or not, it's just, it's a moot point, right? But they're all obvious, right? They're uh, staff. I know staff, right? And I can see a staff. I can, I can hold a staff. I can, whatever, sword, knife, shoot again, whatever, right? But there are a lot of lessons that are not so obvious. Right? And that's, that was the gist of the email. So if you're on the email list, you should have already received it. You might need to look in your spam or promotions or whatever folder. But my point in that was all of the lessons that Hatsumi Sensei slipped into classes. And these were overt classes. These were not like inner circle, private, you know, whatever. Just in the course of, of teaching, right? He would just mention these things. In the books, holy shit, the books are laden with these things. Um, even in the videos, if you have any of the DVDs, right, that that filler material, I'm making quotation marks for those of you on uh, audio only, um, that filler material on the back, right, that just looks like it's the same stuff that's on the back of everything, right? It's just a summary, right? Uh, no, there's some stuff that's hidden in there, right? Um so he would mention things like uh, books or movies or authors, right? Uh, whether they were poets or uh, great philosophers or whatever, right? Um, both Eastern and Western. He would name these things, right? Um, well, he obviously read them. Why would he be mentioning them, right? People sit around the dojo or stand and they're nodding. Oh, yeah, no. Oh, Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. But how many actually go and read the book or go and look up anything by this author or find the original quote? Right. Um, there's almost like this tendency to be spoon fed. Right. But uh, as I point out in the email and you'll see, you'll, you'll see it and get to it. Um, a lot of that stuff, right. It's just, it's not just too damn hard. Like it takes a lot of work. Who's like, who's got time to like live my life and binge watch Netflix and, and watch the weekly Kuden and uh, all this other stuff that I do work and family and everything. And I'm supposed to be reading a freaking book. Uh, well, a book. Uh, no, he's listed a lot more than that. He's listed uh, things from no plays, right? Uh, in Japan, most people know about Kabuki theater, right? But there's this other type of uh, theater, right? Play kind of thing. They're called no right? We would normally spell it like an N-O-H, no, right? But all no plays are based on Buddhist teachings. <gasps> Did I just use the B word? Okay. Um, so one of the points I make in the email, right? And I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, so a lot of people won't go and read it now, right? Um, but these, these lessons aren't just too hard or too difficult, right? Or they might call out somebody's aptitude, in their level of understanding things, but they're also freaking scary because, and this is something that I think I mentioned during the three mysteries uh, webinar that I did uh, last week on Thursday. Um, and by the way, I, I'm re-releasing the replay just for a couple of days for anybody that missed it, really wanted to be in there, but they couldn't do it uh, live or whatever. So anyway, um, but that shit's scary, right? A lot of the stuff that he mentioned, people skip right over it. And they do it consciously or subconsciously. And I, I list a bunch of different reasons um, why people would do this. But what it comes down to is we were taught or programmed or whatever to see things a certain way, right? It's called anchoring bias, 
Okay. They got to us when we were young and dumb. Right. Um, and now we're terrified of looking at these things that have Japanese names or they might be from a, a philo philosophical uh, or religious standpoint that we weren't indoctrinated into or whatever. Right. And see, maybe maybe this is just me. Right. I know it wasn't because my teachers have mentioned these things. Whether I agree with something or not, or whether I'm suspect of something or not, right? I don't believe that I can have a rational, logical, knowledgeable conversation with somebody about that and why it's wrong unless I've studied it, unless I've read it, unless I've looked into it. Not just what's well, wrong because, like, you know, it's just wrong. What I do is right. Well, that's egocentric, right? So, my guys that and, and girls that have been going through like the Sanjay Shichi Dobo and 37 Fundamentals program, the first seven steps program and all that. These are things that we just, we break out shovels and picks and dig deep into these things because until we pull out and understand why we do what we do, the intention, the invisible skills, right? The subconscious and unconscious programming things, whether they're genetic wiring or, stuff that we learn, but we don't even know that we learned it, or it's affecting our decision-making, but we're not doing it consciously, but we don't understand that it, it has more influence than the stuff that we have to remember to do, right? So just some wild and crazy stuff, right? Um, but a lot of it's fear, fear-inducing, right? But either way, they skip over these things, and, and what that produces is the masses, right? Everybody in Ninjutsu, everybody in Bujinkan, everybody, they all feel special. They feel elitist because they're a part of this in the no crowd, right? I train with Hatsumi Sensei. Just because you go to class and that's the guy teaching doesn't mean you're learning everything you think you're learning because the layers upon layers of lessons uh, I mean, it can be mind boggling, right? But but it's it's a lot of fucking work, right? It's just it's just the way it is, right? So, um, but I, I go into much more in that in that email about the different types of lessons that say I'm going to call them hidden, even though they were just he just mentioned the stuff and threw it around, right? Um, and there's a little there's a little thing at the end that I put in there about how learned, right? It's not learned, just in case anybody misreads it. How learned, right? How knowledgeable, how enlightened the man is because he did those things, because he read things, because he studied things, because he went into these things. But often we can think that we're just going to like jump the curb, right? We're just going to leapfrog over things. We don't have to do the same thing because he's read it. So he's going to give it to us. Right. That's what I came to class for. That's what I paid for. Right. Why would he not just try? Because that <laughs> there's a lot. Right. Um, but it's not that he's not teaching it. The hidden part of it is um, one, we may not know what to look for. Two, um, we may be so overwhelmed in the other lessons that we are picking up on that we're not, we miss it. We may be so focused, and this is the masses, right? They're so focused on just the physical fighting aspect, right? The, the worst part of the, of the, of the self-defense paradigm that you ever want to find yourself in. That's what everybody wants to focus on and study first, right? I, I get starting it first because it's going to take you the longest to get, but let's not skip over the things that we think are so simple that it's not worthy of my attention, right? Um, but what's happened is, you know, the greatest percentage of practitioners aren't doing that side. They're not doing the martial arts philosophy. They're not doing, not where it's affecting their life, right? They can regurgitate stuff on, on Facebook, in Facebook groups and forums and all that kind of stuff. But, but, Right? They wouldn't be getting into arguments and stuff with people if they were living the lessons. Okay. Um, anyway, so 
if you got the email, check it out. If you didn't get it and you've already checked through your spam and all that kind of stuff, um, let us know and you know we can send it out, right? Or I'll do a resend if there's too many that didn't get it. Anyway, all right. So, um, which reminds me about sending. Before uh, we go on too far, um, just a quick favor to ask, right? Like, share. Uh, if you haven't joined the um, the Kuden uh, subscriber list, um, please do that, right? You, you should be able to do that on the on the Kuden uh, page, right, James? I'm talking to you guys. Think I'm talking to something off off over here on my desk or something, right? But um, he's hidden in the background like a good ninja, like a good ninja. Alexander's there. I almost made him choke on something he's drinking. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, um, but subscribe if you're over on, uh, on uh, what the hell is that? YouTube. Yeah, there you go. You think I remember that since I'm going to be talking about it. Anyway, all right. So, um, okay. So the cool thing is like, we've got all this stuff, right? Um I'm checking out my notes here to make sure I didn't skip over something. We got all this stuff, right? So all these options, whatever, okay? And I'll be mentioning that again, I'm sure, right? So, um, but there's like a huge problem with the the route that everybody takes. And that route is, I just said it, YouTube, okay? Um, back in my day, right? It's the old guy speaking now, right? Um, the the internet was like <laughs> brand new, right? Um, so you have to remember, I started in this martial art in 1980, okay? Um, some of the people that are students of mine uh, were barely, you know, I don't know, eating their boogers at that age, and some of them weren't even born, right? Um, but the internet was not open to everybody else, right? I mean, that was happening, what, 90s, give or take, right? Uh, 90s, 2000, where things really got started. But when you did searches, right, Google wasn't even around. When you did internet searches using uh, these search things that were named after like the Archies and shit like that, there was an old cartoon, right? Uh, Archie. Veronica, Jughead, there were all these weird freaking names to these things. But you do a search and you'd actually get information back and not ads, right? I know, go figure, right? Okay. So, but they were papers or research things or whatever that were sitting on university uh, servers because that's who started the internet. The internet was college and universities tying the, the repository of knowledge and papers and all that kind of stuff together. Right. So people could research among these things. Right. And then. Right. Everybody else jumped onto it. Right. Well, why did they jump onto it? Well, because stuff started to be uh, offered for. Well, it wasn't free. Uh, you paid what? I don't know. 20, 30 bucks a month for AOL. Right. It was a one stop shop. And right. Okay. So you've got mail. Right. That was so popular of a thing that a movie was named after it. Anyway, so, um, but before that, us old timers, uh, what we had were books with static pictures, okay? That was our video, right? Because the first videos in this art didn't come out until 84 to 86, somewhere in there, right? Where was I? I was stationed in what was then West Germany. So, yeah. 85, 86, something like that. The first one came out, maybe 86. Okay. Anyway, so um, uh, the, the problem with this stuff is that it's easy to get lost, right? The cool thing is, look at all the lessons. Right? I remember a Robin Williams uh, skit where he got lost in his dialogue. Right? I think he was still on cocaine at that time, but he was doing this, his set, right? And he lost, uh, he, he forgot what he was, what he was going to be uh, teaching on. And he turned around and saw all these knickknacks on these shelves. 
And what he said was, look at all the toys. Right? Well, that pops into my head all the time because that's one of the experiences of YouTube, right? Look at all the videos, look at all the lessons, right? And I've had people actually say this on comments under these uh, episodes, or uh, we'll be, I'll, I'll have posted a video about, uh, you know, what are the benefits of, of an instructor or whatever. And I have people posting things like, I don't need an instructor. Look at all this stuff, right? I can do it for free. I can figure it out. Um, they're just highly paid people who regurgitate stuff that I can look up for free. Okay. Not going to dis, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, disagreeing on the whole idea that you can't look stuff up. Right. But what we run into is this, this problem of getting lost. Even if someone doesn't know they're lost. Okay. Um, that doesn't make it, that doesn't mean that they're not lost. Okay. Lots of stories of people disappearing and their car is found hundred miles uh, away from where they're supposed to be in the opposite direction, but they never knew that they were dri driving in the wrong direction. Okay. They knew they were going to get somewhere. Right. But either way. Okay. So there's a question. Why would somebody drive hundred miles in the wrong direction? You'd think that they would have, well, you, you would think unless they were not that they were seeing the same kind of or the things were close enough to what they needed to see as far as reference points in that new direction that it just kept that just kept them moving in that direction there was no there was no reason there were no signs or signals or anything to point out that they were going in the wrong direction okay well you need reference points what are your reference points to know you're going in the wrong direction? Okay. What are your reference points if you don't know what to look for? Okay. So we'll talk more about this as we go along, right? So is it possible to learn from books? Is it possible to learn from YouTube video? Of course, right? Of course, right? It's doable. Absolutely, right? People do it all the time. But how far can that take you, right? Because there are problems, right? The major problem is getting lost, but... How do you get lost? Okay. One, it's too many options. Okay. Too many options. With all those options comes the question what comes first? Right. Am I doing it right? Okay. We're looking at a two dimensional video thing. This is coming from somebody who has video programs for students. Right. But what else do we have? We've got yearly uh, training intensives, right? We have one coming up here at the end of the month um, where people can come in and actually get three-dimensional, well, I call it 10-dimensional uh, feedback uh, because that's what comes from our Mikio study. Uh, they get that, but they're also getting weekly, right? Weekly, every couple of days, there's a training opportunity whether it's a tele class where we're on and it's audio only or classes from the dojo where they're not only watching things, but they can ask questions and get that, get that fog lifted so that they're not just looking at a video lesson and trying to translate it. And then there's what weeks, months, years before they find out that they were doing it incorrectly. Right. Even students in class, if they misunderstand from one class to another, I've got one guy I was just talking to him uh, again the other day. His name is Richard. Richard is easily now my oldest student. That's because people that were older um, passed away. Anyway, um, Richard is what we figure it, Richard was James, uh, almost 80, give or take. Right. Um, let's see. Anyway, I'm not going to do the math. Anyway, Rich has been around for a long time. He's been a student of mine since, let's see, he was 45 when he was a student of mine. When he started as a student, and that was in 1990, 91, something like that. Okay. So, but he and I were discussing um, this this thing because, uh, I don't know, I can't remember how the topic came up in class, but Richard 
has been the most consistent student since he started, right? Um, and he, you know, he's a farmer, he's had other jobs, things like that. But for the longest time, he was consistent at twice a week. The only time that he took any kind of time off was for a week or three during harvesting or planting season because he was a farmer. But then he added extra classes when he got back in to kind of make up for that, right? Now he's having a hard time being able to see when it's darker, that kind of thing. So over the winter months, he only makes it to class once a week because of the way the, the time works out, right? Um, or he switched from Tuesday or Friday to Saturday morning, right? So he wouldn't have that problem. Now it's staying lighter longer. He'll be back to his twice a week kind of thing. As a matter of fact, he started this past week. Um, most consistent, right? And he's most consistent with practice, as in he practices something every day. So what we were talking about was, uh, and this is back a bunch of years where he was coming to our classes and he was doing Tai Chi once a week. But to make sure that lessons got in every day, first thing in the morning before he went to take care of the animals or whatever his daily routine was, um, and he'd have his coffee, he'd have his breakfast, he'd go out and he would do a Tai Chi routine, and he would do something that we worked on in the previous class so that he wouldn't be making the same mistakes in the next class. But where the, where the humorous part of the chat came in was, this is what we were talking about. We were talking about how if you make a mistake – and you practice consistently, the longer you practice, the more you're wiring the mistake, the, the misunderstanding, into your system, mentally, physically, whatever, right? And so luckily, Richard came to class twice a week, Tuesday and Friday. So it was only a couple of days. But it was still Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, right? Things are starting to get wired into, into the system. And then he come to class on Friday or he did Friday. So now we got Saturday practice, Sunday practice, Monday practice, Tuesday practice. Shit, we're back in class. on Anyway, so um, and then he would do something and I'd call him out on it. And he'd go, oh, my God, last class, I thought what you did was this or I thought what I was seeing was this thing here. So that's the way I practiced. Okay. Now what we have is because it's getting wired into muscle memory. Now he has to undo. He has to take the, the corrected lesson and he has to do that enough to at least get back to zero point before he can start making progress with getting that wired into the system because he has to undo the mistake. That's why we practice every time we get a new lesson. It's not enough to understand in our head. We have to get that understanding into our body. And to get into our body, we have to rewire everything from, from neurosynapses, synapt synaptic pathways that send the signals from the brain to the, to the muscles and things like that, right? Um, we have to get that in enough that it becomes the new habit, the new instinctive pattern, right? Um, and we have to do that long enough that it seats and becomes unconscious, right? So that was only, what, when I count out, three to four days, right? And by the next class, Richard was already doing that thing without thinking about it, right? So shit, right? So I, I was saying, you know, what happens when somebody's not consistent with class or, um, whatever's going on, right? Whether it's going to seminars or putting themselves in front of a teacher where they can be, they can be helped. They can be corrected. Right. And they just keep practicing the same thing over and over again. Oh, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you practice physically, that's helpful. But even if you run patterns in your head, right. Just like a lot of people end up fighting like they've seen other fighters fight. 
movies, TV, all that kind of stuff. The more we watch those things, the more that stuff gets wired into our system, right? This is not belief. This is science, right? So now we've got to undo them, right? So, but who do we have telling us that we're not doing it correctly? Who do we have, uh, who do we have that can help us translate quote unquote right or correct, right? Because we're always going to translate things based on what we see, what we think we see, right? And we can't translate it past our own level of understanding, which is why all these yahoos that make comments under my videos about how something will work or something won't work. And it's really freaking funny because a lot of the things that they tell me won't work, I've used against real bad guys over and over again. And so I wish they would have told me before I used them. That way I could have gotten my ass kicked and not actually whipped a good technique on them, right? But their idea of what works and what doesn't work is based on experience. It's based on knowledge. It's, so here's the thing, right? One, this is a lesson. I think I mentioned this in an email uh, as well, but nothing in ninjutsu is what it appears to be. Okay. So, and a lot of Budo, a lot of general Bujutsu is this way as well. Cause it's new. If, we were out to fight like everybody else, then there wouldn't be all of these damn Ryuha. There wouldn't be all of these different systems because every system developed to have secrets that nobody else knew about. So when you whip that on them, they wouldn't be prepared for it. Right? Why the hell would the Bujinkan have nine different systems if they each didn't bring something to the table that contributed to the greater whole? If they were all the same, then all you have is egoistic bragging rights. Yeah, well, our system has nine schools. Yeah, well, our system has you know, whatever. Okay. So this is, things aren't what they appear to be, right? So when we're watching a video or we're watching a teacher demonstrate something, James, this ever happened in class? I know it did for me when I was coming up through the ranks, right? I watch a teacher. You're only looking at things from one perspective, which means you can't see what? You can't see how much more around it, which is why when you see me demonstrate things, a lot of people get bored with this or they get irritated or they fast forward through things. God, I've seen it. Really? Okay. Since students don't move around the, the dojo while the teacher is demonstrating, I learned that I had to make up for that. So instead of demonstrating things from the same angle, and my teachers did that, right? A lot of my, most of my teachers, including Atsumi Sensei, just almost always from the same angle, right? Which means I'm not seeing at least 75% of the technique because I can't see through their bodies. I can't see what's happening on the other side. I can't see the exact angle and perspective and whatever, right? And by the time something happens, because of the way our processor, right, our brain processes things, we're already almost a quarter of a second in the past. So there's going to be little glitches where we're missing things, right? Timing, uh, distancing, angling, the kotsu, the essential nature of the technique, what's it doing? Not what it looks like it's doing because, and this is, this is what we need to understand. We can't see these things in videos, right? Hatsumi Sensei's mentioned this, right? We couldn't see it way back in the day when it was just, you know, three pictures, 10 pictures, whatever, to show a whole sequence. One of my very first teacher in this art reminded us that there was the, the important stuff was happening in the pictures between the pictures, how to get from one to the next. And you need to be able to learn how to see. Right? We talked about that in the previous episode, I think. Gone Ho, right? How to see, right? The, it's the art of using your eyes. Okay? And we had to be able to look at things like that and be able to see the pictures between the pictures or the, the stuff that we can't see. Now, what I do is I keep changing angles because students don't move. So I rotate the demonstration around uh, in our video programs, right? Uh, whether James is helping me or Drew's helping me or whatever, um, we're constantly, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out lines of, of angle and whatnot to give them enough that 
they can they can see more and more with each one, right? Um, but most videos online, most videos on YouTube, right? And God help you if you watch shorts, right? And then people are like having major debates, like you can learn something from a 10 to 60 second video. Okay, you get little snapshots, but you you already have to have a lot of training under your belt. But then is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on the training, right? Depends on your interpretation of things, right? So uh, the difficulty is in being able to see those things, right? Because again, if if it was obvious, then then everybody will then everybody will be able to see it, right? And if we're basing everything based on the beginner lesson, right? The initiation. I don't care what kata, right? And we're making a mistake with how we deliver the strike or when we do the uke nagash or whatever. And it's the big model because the the way a kata or the way a model is introduced to you, it's ginormous. And I, I don't mean number of moves. I mean, it, it starts with the obvious, okay? Because it's easier for you to see if you're doing a step right or if you missed one or whatever. Right. But over time, that gets buttoned up and the timing changes. There's a distancing, angling kind of connection, all those kind of things. Right. To where he shouldn't be able to see it because you start learning about invisible things. Right. Perceptual gaps. Okay. Remember those little almost quarter of a second timing delays between when something enters a, uh, a, a sensory receptor, eyes, ears, touch, whatever, right? And the time it takes for the brain to process it and trigger a response, whether you're going to say something, have a different thought, uh, it fires muscles to move your body or whatever. There's like almost a quarter of a second delay. It's about 200 milliseconds, unless you've had a head injury or a couple of brain surgeries before you ran for office. Anyway, so I know I said it. Anyway, so, but there's this perceptual gap. And for the best of us, right, it's still just under a quarter of a second. For reference, 250 milliseconds is one quarter of a second. Okay. So, right. And if you're exhausted, if you've been hit a couple of times or whatever, it slows it down. There's one of the reasons why we hit certain things that we hit because it increases the gap. And then your next move is done inside that gap. So if your timing's off, he's recovered before you do your next move. That's why he's blocking it. That's why he's stopping it. Okay? Or if your body throws a tell that he's used to seeing because that signals a certain type of an attack, then that's why his block gets, gets put into place because he's not triggered by the fist coming in. He's triggered by the shoulder moving or by your body going lifting or lowering or whatever. It breaks the eye line, right? So really kind of screwed up stuff. Okay, so that's one thing, right? Um, so how do you how do you translate something that isn't obvious? Right? Um, anyway, and on top of that, we're not even going to talk about skill level and, and shit that's going on where um, I mean, I, I've got weight on me and stuff like that. But some of the, some of these guys, man, the stiffness in their joints and, and the timing and the way they land and whatever. And I, I get it, right? People people pick and choose from the folks that they like. I get it. I know there's a lot of people that follow me uh, because I said something at some point that they like uh, and everything is good. And then they don't follow me anymore because I said something that pissed them off, right? Or that shook them at their, their core or whatever. Right. Well, that's not what I want to hear. Well, OK, but it's there's a huge difference between wanting to hear something. Because you think it'll get you where you want to go and needing to hear something that the teacher knows you need to hear so that you absolutely get over there. Right. But ego does ego. Right. Anyway, another problem. And um, I don't know if people understand this or not, because, you know. I study ninja two. I train in ninja two, or whatever. Well, okay, who's your teacher? Well, I don't really have one. I just use YouTube. Okay, great. 
Okay. But here's the thing. And this is spelled out by the kanji used to write this stuff, right? Do you ha? Do you ha? Right? Do you means flow. Okay. In one context, it means flow. Okay. So, Eo do you ha? The reason it's translated as lineage is because it's like a river flowing from the past through the present into the future. Okay. You're not a part of a lineage if you're not in the flow of transmission. What that means is teacher to student who becomes a teacher to student who becomes a teacher to student. Right? There's lots of people. <laughs> I've been in Japan, lots of people, right? I train with Hatsumi Sensei. I only train with Hatsumi Sensei, right? Uh, Hatsumi Sensei is my teacher. And then I found out later that um, there was no acknowledge or acceptance or acknowledgement of this teacher-student connection by the teacher. What they did was they only went to Hatsumi Sensei's classes as a participant but in their head, because they only went to his classes, he was their teacher. It's not the way it works. The student asks for the teacher to be responsible for their learning and growth and whatnot. And the teacher says yay or nay based on the quality, aptitude, dedication, passion, or whatever of the student. Okay? But only with that connection does that make it a part of a you, of a lineage of this flow, right? So anyway, um, let's do this. Let's, let's take a little pause here. Um, James, questions, comments, who's on, who do I need to say hey back to uh, before we move on to the next part here, which uh, we'll talk about an, an answer that I get from students. Uh, all the time. It's you. I know it's you. You. I bet you knew you before I did, because you saw yourself in the mirror this morning. <laughs> uh, Carl's on. Dave. Trinity. Awesome. 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 Trinity's a part of the lineage twice. She's my daughter. <laughs> That's a different flow. The only comment is Carl said none of the emails he received had a list. Uh, it was a short list. I don't, it was like three bullet points as far as the list goes. The rest of it was alluding to things. The, the bullet points are three reasons that an ego would see uh, the lessons that I was alluding to that Hatsumi Sensei taught um, as scary. So if you didn't get that one, let me know and I'll uh, get it out to you again. Uh, is that it? That's all we have? That's it. All right. Well, as one of my partners when I was an MP used to say, well, shit the bed. Okay. So, uh, okay. So let's get back into this, right? So, um, one, one of the most common answers I get from students when I ask them what they're working on is, well, I'm pretty much working on everything. And I'm going to call BS on that. Okay. I don't mean best self. Uh, I don't mean any of those things, right? I don't, I don't mean belief system. Well, maybe. One of these is triggered by, well, they're both triggered by a belief system, but I'm calling BS, right? Because it's impossible to work on everything at any given time, okay? I mean, in any single lineage, it would be difficult. It would be impossible to work on everything at one time, right? And in this one, in Nijutsu, <laughs> that makes me want to laugh. Anyway, so here's what it really comes down to, okay? When students say that, there's one of two reasons that they're telling me they're pretty much working on everything, right? And if if, if the first one, right, it's a cop out. They're not working on anything. They're, they're, they're not practicing. They're not studying, right? Every once in a while, they'll think about practicing, but then, you know, I don't know. 
a cat video pops up online. Who knows, right? Um, these people, I'm going to mention delusion here in a minute, but th these people are deluded because they th think that the teacher can't see that they're not working on anything. And the easiest way to see that is the teacher keeps correcting the same fucking mistakes all the time. Right. Um, so that's, it's, it's easy to see. Right. But the first reason it's, it's a cop out, right. They're, they're not practicing anything, but they're, they, they use that because they don't want to highlight on any one thing. Now, there's a subset of those where it's an ego fear thing because they don't want to have to show a given thing. Okay. Or they don't want to get caught naming the same things over and over again or have the teacher point out like I do, like one of my teach, a couple of my teachers have, right? Um, what do you think I need to work on, Sensei? What don't you like? What do you mean? What don't you like doing? That probably needs the most work. Because if you don't like doing it, you probably don't do it. It's a very, very small percentage. We're talking 1% to 2% of students in any system, any learning thing, okay, will force themselves to work on stuff because it has nothing to do with liking it. It has to do with it being a requirement or it's necessary for survival or whatever. Okay. So, uh, but most won't, okay? And so several of my teachers, I would overhear somebody say, what do you think I need to work on, Sensei? What do you like doing? Okay. So other times a teacher would say, um, think about the stuff that you like the least, okay? And so you'll think about this. Okay, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. And one of my teachers would go past that. He'd let you think about a couple of things and maybe even name it out loud. And then he'd say, now, what do you really not like? Because that stuff isn't even on your list because you haven't thought about it or thought about doing it way longer. Okay. So... There's that, right? It's a cop-out thing. It's a, it's an ego thing, whatever, okay? Um, the other one is when somebody says, I'm working on, uh, pretty much working on everything, right? It's delusion, right? Um, they, they can't work on everything. And even if they try, and I know that some people, when I say delusion, they're trying to work on everything, right? But that, if you were to work on everything, it leads to... On one side, it leads to overwhelm because you're trying to focus on too much stuff and you can't hold it all in there. You just feel like, oh, there's too much and whatever. It leads to quitting. It leads to <laughs> my favorite, taking time off. Some people have taken time off that's lasted a decade or three, right? Now they're asking me questions like, how do I get back in? Well, you're already back in. What are you going to do with it? Okay. Uh -huh. So anyway, the other thing it can lead to, um, this, this delusion, is it leads to, on one side is overwhelm, on the other side, it's, um, it's piss poor technique. Well, how does it lead to piss poor technique? Because if you're working on everything, then no thing is getting the requisite time to get into subconscious, into subconscious storehouse, into muscle memory, nothing. These people are practicing all the time. It's kind of like a hamster on a wheel. They're practicing all the time, but they're not going anywhere. They feel like they're working, and they are but they're not doing anything in a logical way where they will end up owning a technique. Right? I talked about the difference between, you know, wanting and needing and those kind of things. There's a difference between having learned something and having integrated that to where you can use it without having to think about it. 
right? It becomes the new way of movement. It becomes the new way of mentally processing things. It goes from doing something. This is something I've been talking about since I, I, I know I highlighted it during the Thursday um, webinar I just did for the folks that are interested in Miko. It's on that page. It's on the page of the program we're going to be starting. Is it next week? It's next week, right? The 18th is next week. Next week. Is that right, James? Thursday. Pop in my. I don't know. James looks like he froze up. Uh, what is it? Thursday, the 18th. Yeah, next week. Okay. So uh, I'm initiating people into this uh, Mikyo practice called the Goshimbo. It's a psychological self defense uh, practice, right? Um, so what I've been mentioning is that this is not another way of doing things. This is not about doing. She can do all the time. Right. But it's a way of it's not doing different. It's being different. Okay? If you're still the same and you would need to think about how to do a technique or how to do a certain move or how to try to find his fight style or the weakness in his movement or whatever. I don't know if you've ever been in a fight or not, but that shit happens way too fast. And that's why, and I've, I've had people that have been on, on trainings with me where they completely dismiss this training process because it's been their experience that like they learn all this stuff, works in a dojo and these are cops, right? Then they end up in the shit on the street and everything goes to hell in a handbasket and they just end up always fighting the same way. Well, they're ex-students because they didn't like to hear that I said that they didn't practice the stuff to the point where they weren't doing it. They weren't, they didn't stop when they did it right in class. They stopped when they couldn't get it wrong. Which is the problem with like Richard, when I talked about him earlier, right? The problem, see, because you, you can't make a decision in either way without being <laughs> disappointed, right? If I don't practice, it takes forever to get in. And then if I get smacked around before it's in, well, that's going to lead to a certain type of disappointment. Or I practice my ass off, literally some days. And because of all the extra practice, a mistake gets in and settles, and then I've got to fix the mistake to get back on track. Well, either way, there's disappointment, right? But you pick your poison because that's the way we're wired, right? No practice means you stay the same, hoping you'll remember what to do. Or you practice your ass off, you get through a whole bunch of mistakes to the point where you can't screw it up. That way, when you need it, you can't screw it up. Because it's not something you do, it's a part of who you are, okay? If you drive, you cannot not find the brake pedal. As soon as you see somebody do something stupid, that might result in you being in a collision. You can't not stop or control how your hands move the steering wheel to move the whole car, not just you, but the whole car away from, because you've been doing it so much that driving is not something you do. It's so much a part of who you are that you can freaking eat food. You can be thinking about a problem back at the office uh, earlier or something your spouse said uh, three days ago or whatever, and it's pissed you off again or whatever. And some part of you is driving the damn car because you're not consciously thinking about driving the car. You're consciously thinking about punching somebody in the throat or whatever. This is the way training should be. We have to get to that point because shit happens too fast. And if we truly believe that this is the stuff that's supposed to, it's, it's, it's the fucking cat's meow. It's the thing that's supposed to save my life. Then I need to be focusing on doing it until I want to freaking throw up and then doing it more because it has to get, it has to become the new thing. And you'll know that when 
you know, there's a sound that startles you or a friend sneaks up on you or whatever, right? And you move away from them and your your limbs come up and you're in some kind of a come I and not that oh shit move that, that every other human being makes, right? So, um, so again, this leads to these things, right? But how do you make sense of it all? Right? How do you make sense out of out of all of these lessons? How do you make sense out of like how do you know? Right? Well, one of the things you can do, right? We'll talk about another one in some other episode because you can see how long this stuff takes, right? Um, is prioritizing, right? Knowing, learning how to prioritize your lessons and your training as a whole. Okay. Uh, and I know I've mentioned this guy in the past. He wasn't a martial artist, not that I know of, right? Uh, but he was a, a business coach. He was a CEO of multi-million dollar places and stuff. But he was a sales coach, all that. His name was Zig Ziglar. That was not a nom, or that was not a nom de plume kind of thing. His parents named him Zig. It's probably short for something, but I don't know. Anyway, but he uh, he one of his key phrases or quotes was, if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. And there's, there's two ways that we can aim for nothing, right? One is we can just have that whatever attitude, right? Just do something, man. Doing something's better than nothing at all. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and the other one, is to throw so much shit out there with the hope that it's going to land. But again, right, we're doing all this stuff. We're doing all these techniques. We're doing all these things. But no thing gets enough attention to become a thing that I would bet my life on and not in a deluded way. Okay? Uh, I've, I've told these stories different times or whatever, but the – I've had multiple moments and I remember the very first time it happened, right? It wasn't even like a real threat, but I processed it like a real threat. Um, I was, I was uh, in the army. I was a military policeman and I just gotten off duty and uh, it was a long stretch. And so I was leaving um, the barracks area to go home uh, because I was married, had my family uh, there and we were living off post and, you know, close enough I could walk and, gave me time to think and plan and go th run th some of these things through my head, uh, training wise and all that. And, uh, I was getting, it was just this long hallway, a couple of doors on the right side. So it was the first sergeant's office. If you've been in the military, you know what I'm talking about. There was a first sergeant's office, uh, company commander's office and, uh, operations office. And then I came from a day room area, which is basically a rec room, and passed the uh, opening to the stairwell, right, to go upstairs and then out through another, uh, down into the, what we have downstairs. Oh, the armory, right, where all of our uh, pistols and stuff were. So um, I'm, I'm, I remember being in deep thought. The wall was literally right beside me. And we had a, a, a glass door at the end, right, it was just entry exit kind of thing. And, um, two guys had come in, this was a Friday, two guys had come in. Um, I'm going home for the weekend. They're coming in. They lived in the barracks. There were two single guys shared a room or whatever. And so the one guy comes in, he's shorter about my height, maybe a little bit taller. Well, he had to be a little bit taller because the minimum height for a military policeman was five, eight and I'm five, six and change. And I got in because they were short on MPs. And so I got a waiver. Otherwise, I'd have been doing military intelligence. That was my backup. So I'd have been one of those guys that was an oxymoron. Anyway, inside joke, unless you were in the military. So, uh, and then the other guy, Lance, really tall guy, one of the only two people I've ever met from Wyoming, uh, was carrying like a case of beer, right? Because I guess he was the big guy, so he got to carry the beer. Anyway, I can't remember the guy's name that was up front. I remember Lance. Lance was in my training group. But this other guy just yakking, whatever, right? And so next thing I know, all I hear is, and for you, and hands are coming at me, right, to grab me. And 
Next thing I know, I've whipped a Musha Dodi on this guy and laid him out on the floor and had my hand ready to go. And what broke through that moment, if you've ever watched um, the movie The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise, there's a scene after he's done a whole bunch of training with these guys, right? There's a scene in a village square where he's surrounded by these other swordsmen and this Sagan happens, this, this natural kind of way of seeing under stress that the left brain is sending little glimpses in, but there's this spidey sense, right? Ninja sense, whatever that happens. And that's, that took over as soon as those, those hands were recognized, the amygdala did its thing. The hypothalamus did its thing. And um, I have a glimpse of, applying a musha dori and i had to process it later to realize that i didn't consciously do it or did i right was musha dori doing me or was i doing musha dori i know how that sounds weird and boo boo but that's that's a that's a level anyway uh we we discuss this stuff in in on the mikyo side of training a lot um but I felt it. What do you mean you felt it, Sensei? Don't you mean you recognized it as an option? No, because I had done Musha Dori so many times correctly that my sensory system knew what it felt like. When I had it, it was already starting to work which leads to one of the lessons in, in the scrolls. How do you always have the right technique in every moment? And the answer, the secret is you never do a technique that's not already working. That's what I felt. His arm was already buckling, not because I was twisting on it. It was just folding right. And my arm in, in covering against it just fell right into place. And out of that recognition, I just did that and laid him out. And what broke through that fog, right, that that village square kind of sight that's depicted in the movie is him yelling, whoa, I was just kidding. And that's when left brain came back. And here's another MP. This guy's got this look in his eyes that's just like, I made a mistake. And I chuckled and reached down and patted him on the cheek. And I said, me too. I got up, got up, let him up, right? Meanwhile, Lance is laughing his ass off. And I walked out and I got a couple of steps outside the door. And I realized that I just did that. That was this art. There was no thinking behind it. That was in real time. And that technique just came out. Not, I had to think about doing it. It's not my favorite, whatever. And I remember having one of those moments. You know the moments, right? Like, yes, right? And then I walked home trying to deconstruct that, that situation. Like, what all went into that, right? But it takes a lot more to get it out of left brain into feeling, which is one of the things that to me since I met meant when he used the, the phrase, it's the feeling. You have to find the feeling. You have to, you know, those, those kind of things. He didn't mean happy, sad, depressed, whatever, right? There's lots of, and again, listening to how he's describing things and the context of the, of the situation or the, the lesson will allow you to translate what feeling he's talking about, what type of feeling, what's the definition for feeling in this context. Because if you only have one and that's the way you translate all of them, well, then not you because you guys are all enlightened, but the you that I'm talking to, well, you're wrong more often than not because you keep using the same damn translation, right? So anyway. Um, so 
when I, when I say prioritizing, right, I'm talking about knowing what comes first when we're learning a new technique, what comes next, right? What comes first um, in the new module or the new rank that I'm in or the new level that I'm in, right? Or just what comes next, right? Where should the primary focus be? What will that do for me kind of thing, right? But I need to know where I am. And the problem that a lot of folks have with that overwhelm is they don't have a structure. They don't have, I talked about this in the last episode, right? So if those of you who missed it, find episode 203 on, on YouTube in the live tab there. And we talked about develop, developing a plan for, uh, for always knowing who you are, okay? Well, see, I don't want to talk about prioritizing at that point because you saw how long that, for those of you who are, are, follow all the time, you, you, you see how long that lesson was just to focus on, um, on developing a plan, okay? But this prioritizing isn't just about what techniques, what skills come first, okay? It's also about... what am I trying to develop and am I where I'm supposed to be in that paradigm, in that, in that flow, or have I just tried to jump over 50 monkeys because I don't like that stuff, or I want to shortcut the system like so many people did um, trying to imitate Atsumi Sensei um, without going through the same process that he went through to get to there. Right. Um, and what I saw more often than not practicing in Japan was Hatsumi Sensei would, would um, show something or one of the other master teachers would show something. And then we'd go to practice and I'd glance over and I swear to God that for um, half the class, whole class, whatever, certain students and their partners just kept doing the same shit over and over again. Not even close to what he demonstrated because they just kept ending up in the same place and they, they were like one hit wonders. And I'm not knocking them as long as the attack happens the way that their one hit wondership works. Great. Right. But either way. Right. But it's not just about that. How have we prioritized training and skill development within the greater context of our life? Okay. Do we say it's important, but we default to other people's or somebody else's whim or whatever because, well, they really don't like it. So I have to kind of like, you know, dance around things or sneak things in or I don't do it as often as I would like to because uh, they'll be mad at me or. Okay. Um, and everybody fights their own demons. It, that's just the way it is. But, um, and I, I, this is, this marriage is not my first time around the rodeo. However, it's the longest one and it's the most solid. So there's that, right? But regardless of the situation, okay, even before I was married, I made it very, very clear going in. This is not something I do. This is so much part of who I am. And you may not understand it. You may not like it. But, and you may not believe that a situation like this will ever happen, but it's my responsibility to keep you safe. So this is my means for doing that. And it's not likely to change ever. If it ever changes, it's probably because I don't want to keep you safe anymore. But that's not my genetic wiring or my personal personality character trait kind of thing. Um, I would even protect an enemy or somebody that I didn't like in the moment because they're another human being. And if they're being attacked, then there's, there's rare situations that I would not step in. Um, like if it was all equal, right. It was just two demons going at it. Hash it out, boys. Have a good time. Okay. But generally speaking, when I'm not getting along with somebody, um, it's they've got a problem uh, with me and 
my problem with them is uh, I know why I do what I do and I'm not changing it. Okay? Not this is what I do. I can't do anything about it. This is me. No, that's, that's not the same. Okay. So anyway, um, so there's, there's three levels there, right? One is personal, right? How important is this? If it's important, then it's one of the things at the top of the list, right? Other ones have to do with, um, with knowing what skill levels have to come first and not because, not because that's what the scrolls say. Right? An important piece of information is knowing that during the Sengoku Jedi, Jedi Warring States period, people started training in their martial arts lessons somewhere between the ages of four and six. It's wrapped around, uh, it's wrapped around um, uh, game play, uh, you know, sword fighting play with Boken, those kind of things, right? So by the time they got to the grown-up lessons, okay, Sanshin Kyonopo. They might even have had a lot of the Sanshin growing up as a kid, right? But now we're looking at strategy. We're looking at doing things where we're conserving energy. We're prepping that still pretty much a child, right? They were adults in their teens, okay, um, for Battlefield which means we're not going to do a lot of the shit that we do while we're playing because we get winded too fast. Right. So things have to change. Right. Um, what I was taught by, by teachers is that um, most of the people that came to the system from the outside, I mean, if you didn't, then you stuck around long enough to learn the stuff that everybody else had like nine out of 10 people had, which was they had already had heads in their closet, which means they knew how to punch. They knew how to kick. They knew, they knew how to fight in some way, but they were, they wanted to learn this, any particular Yuha, because they probably saw it, realized somebody from that school would kick their ass. So how about if I learn that? Because I don't know that stuff. I don't know it that way. There's lots of stories about that. Um, uh, some of the historians in our in our uh, art uh, point this stuff out, right? And they'll name names, and I don't bother trying to memorize names. What sticks out is this person who was a senior master teacher in this particular system um, would look at other systems. Kind of reminds me of how Hatsumi Sensei did things, right? Hatsumi Sensei has bought scrolls. Um, from defunct lineages or whatever, right? And goes through them and tries to understand it, not by translating that based on the way we do things, but going through that and doing things and because he wants to find the secret nuggets inside there that would actually make the stuff we already have better. But see, that's where the purists go wrong because, right, it's already perfect. If it were already perfect, then why the hell would our soke continue to do that? See, another question that maybe I'm just the, re the only retard that asks it. I know I use the word, but I used it toward me. So don't be offended for me. That really irritates me. People get offended for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> which means, I don't know, their ass is made of paper more than everybody else's is. Anyway, so, um, but again, this all kind of points back to what? Points back to the importance of having a teacher, whether we're talking about the lineage flow or whatever. And I'm not talking about that during that, during this one, it's just something that kind of came up as I was kind of thinking about how I wanted to present things, right? But prioritizing puts a logical structure on things so that we don't miss critical things when we leapfrog over something. It keeps us from 
ignoring certain things because we don't like it, it prevents us from missing things because of the way we currently translate things based on inner uh, skills and knowledge and perspective and whatnot, right? Um, which reminds me, James, rem help me remember to mention Aaron's question, which was not about the physical fighting, it was from the Mikio side. Just if you remember, if you remember to remind me that, I'll I'll remember the rest of it. And I just don't want to do a segue here. So, um, one of the reasons for having a teacher is if they're passing things on the way they're supposed to be and they have experience at using this stuff under the worst conditions, not just sparring in the dojo, which is at least something, right? Um, then they can tell you, look, I understand you have questions. I have students coming to me all the time, right? When are we going to work on this? Okay. Well, I get it. That's important, right? Like when are we going to work on multiple attackers? holy shit, can you deal with one attacker at minimum 80% full speed and you're, this is the stuff that comes out and not, oh shit, jutsu or whatever? Because um, if not, then we probably shouldn't be looking at multiple attackers yet. Okay? Even two attackers, because contrary to popular belief, defending against two attackers is not twice as difficult as dealing with one. It's like, four times depending on the attackers could be as much as six times it's not that easy right Togakuri school had two everything doubled after that two four eight sixteen thirty two i think the highest level uh of one of the training areas that's alluded to in the Togakure uh menkyo is 64. that's an oh fuck situation so, and the Chuck Norris style of doing things where you deal with one or two of them at a time is not going to cut it because in the context that we're looking at from the single Jedi wearing state period is any one or all of them could freaking, and they all have swords, by the way, and you don't have anything but maybe Shuriken and, or some Mitsubishi, right, lining powder. So um, one or all of them could stab your ass at the same time. So it's very counterintuitive. But if somebody just reads that or hears me teach on it, like, man, how do you physically defend? Well, you don't. Well, there is some physical stuff, but yeah, no. You need to be good at throwing shuriken and you need to be good at deploying blinding powder. And you need to be good at assessing the weak links of those who are surrounding you. Because it's not about fighting from inside the circle. It's about getting outside the circle. So you go from being surrounded to all the bad guys being behind you. Right? It's strategic and tactical thinking that makes up 90%, 95% of those techniques. Physical martial skill. When I, when I, physical martial skill, not tactics and strategies. Makes up 5 to 10% at best. It's kind of like... Defending against somebody with a firearm. Easily, 90% is psychology. 10% is technique. Okay. But what's the easier thing to do for the uninformed, misinformed, or outright lazy? Learn the physical step-by-step -step moves and feel all good about yourself. And then you got the technique right, you can stop. Which is a joke that some of my students have in class. They'll be struggling with something. Right, James knows they'll be struggling with something. All of a sudden, they'll get it right, and they go, "Shit, I got it right. Okay, I can go home now." And that's the joke, right? That they're not going home, but they had that breakthrough and they got it. But the joke is, well, that's what a lot of people do. Okay, um, so this is where where a teacher shines, right? And again, as long as the people know, train with whoever you want. Okay, just make sure it's. You know, not necessarily just because I like them. I like them, therefore I trust them. Hmm. I don't think those two correlate. Huh? I can like people. See, liking somebody is emotional. Trusting them is situational. Because there's people that I like that... 
that I would not want to be trapped in a dark alley with them as my backup. Because I know they don't know anything. And they're quite likely, and some of them are likely to exacerbate the problem, to make it worse. Right? There's other people that I have a relationship with. You know, I don't know that it's a like thing. It's acceptable that, you know, we'd be in the same situation or whatever. Okay. They can be in a dark alley with me because I know they, they would side on the, on the side of right. And since I'm not a jag wagon that goes and starts things, then if we got stuck in a situation, you know, you see this in, it's kind of a movie theme uh, every, in, in some movies where uh, enemies are kind of shoved together because, you know, they, they have to deal with this major issue. Right. That they both want to go away. Right. So you end up as allies uh, for expedience. When I was when I was a cop, I wasn't always partnered up with somebody that I got along with. Right. On patrol, we barely spoke. And if we did, it was about the job or whatever. But if we did a traffic stop, if we went to a crime scene, if we were dealing with an arrest or whatever. I could trust that he would do his job. He could trust that I would do my job. We, we would do nothing to harm our partner, nothing like that, right? So, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but liking and trusting are not, they're, they're not, they're not connected. Okay? So, uh, but what often what people need to start with is just having a structure, right? We point these things out every once in a while. So I'm going to have James do the same thing uh, that we've had him do uh, re- uh, consistently in the in the past is, James, if you could pop up the or in the chat or whatever, put the, uh, the link for the do-it-yourself or done-for-you uh, blueprint, which is the five uh, module-level workbooks. And then for, as a bonus, we threw in the Shodan, the Nidon, uh, curriculum that way you at least have something um to work by i mean we practically give these things away i mean they're not free because i've got to break even on all this stuff that i pay for so that you can have free stuff um but um it gives you everything that my students have from white belt to secondary black belt and those things are not listed arbitrarily i have some friends that have curriculum where it's not arbitrary either, but here's this lineage, here's this lineage, here's this lineage, here's this lineage. Okay, well, that's how does that make things foundational? Well, this is like the Shodan no Maki, and then this is the Chuden no Maki. And the, yeah, but Shodan doesn't mean beginner level. The kanji for show is not the kanji for beginner, right? It's not even the kanji for first, it's the kanji for top for highest, okay? Because that's where the most important lessons go, right? So again, if we're mistranslating things, well, I didn't know that. Well, okay, right? It's kind of like the, well, it's not as bad as the guys that, you know, like to point out that because I have omomori hanging off my belt that I got in Japanese temples and shrines and whatnot, right? Good juju. Um, Did he forget to take the price tags off his pants? Yes, absolutely. Right. So if they don't know what they're looking at with regards to that, what else are they missing? Okay. So anyway, those guys' pants look like they've been around the block. Yeah, I teach and I train. So uh, my pants are more <laughs> more faded than probably any other clothes that I have. And uniforms are freaking expensive. So I'm getting all the wear and tear out of those damn things as I can. But I also buy like the uh, heavyweight things that are, what are they? 12 ounce, 14 ounce, something like that. So they're cotton duck. So yeah, they're going to fade before they wear out. Right. If your uniform's not faded, then you've got color fast cotton polyester, which doesn't absorb sweat at all. Um, And some people have never noticed because they don't sweat in their uniform. Um, and they also don't fade very well unless you, I don't know, put them in the back dash of your car with the window and drive around in the summertime and then they get sun bleached. 
but then they have a weird uh, camouflage pattern, <laughs> pattern to them. Anyway, all right. So, James, you got that handled okay? Yeah, that's all right. Okay. So I'm going to roll back here a little bit because uh, one of my students, uh, Sensei Reinhardt, actually sent me a message earlier. Um, and so I'm going to put it in the context that she sent it, but I want you to think about this in the context of your physical training as well. Okay. Because this highlights uh, a big thing that pops up. And because we have a teacher student relationship, she can reach out and send, send a, a, a message and get an answer, right? Not just an answer, but an answer that has will be tweaked for her and that unique situation. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but uh, you can send messages, emails. I used to have to send handwritten letters, right? To a teacher that's not your teacher, right? They're a teacher. And then if you get an answer back, it may be a canned answer because they don't know you. So they can't, they don't have anything to base it on other than a canned answer. And then, you know, are we sending a letter to them because we just made a list of a bunch of black belts who should have an answer to this, or I assume will have an answer to this, but maybe that realm isn't. Or you get one back that says, oh, uh, this is best to set up as a private uh, uh, class on Zoom. And so that'll be $300 for an hour. Uh, anyway, so here was the question, right? Uh, Aaron had uh, gone through part of, she has this job where she's traveling and had cell phone dropout and all that. But she was listening in on the, uh, the Mikio training that I did this past Thursday. And uh, what I was covering during that is uh, known as the three mysteries, the secret, three secrets, the Sanmitsu. Most of you guys who've been around in Nijitsu for any length of time know this or should know it because it's a major crux, not just in Mikyo, but also in Nijitsu, right? Um, so most people understand the roughly translated thought, word, and deed. But she was having some confusion um, and having a hard time separating the thought and the word part because I'm going to have to get more clarity from her specifically. But I can see where one of the problems would be where she thought thought is anything that's going on in the head, right? But it isn't. Right? It's not necessarily conscious level. It can be, but most of it isn't. If you're thinking, or talking to yourself or whatever in your head, that's word. But most people would think word only comes out of your mouth, but can also come out of your hand. Because if I write out my affirmations or I write out my plan or whatever, that's also word. It's using word. So it doesn't matter if I'm talking to myself, talking to somebody else, or writing out a plan that I'm going to follow. That's all word. Okay? It's all word. So now what I'm going to do to help her and because if she's asking this, there's probably some other people because she's been studying. She's gone through the seven steps. She's gone through uh, 37 fundamentals, all this kind of stuff. She's done private training with me on this side. So if she's still having issues with this, then people brand new to this or other ones are probably having trouble with it as well. So I will be doing a free uh, webinar this Thursday coming up. That's going to dive into these three things much more involved. Now, we're not going to put them into practice. I already did that in the closed door one. Um, we, we're really going to focus on the <laughs> the Sanmitsu within the Sanmitsu, but I'm going to spend a lot of time focusing on the mind part of it, the thought part of it. But I will also be tying that for those of you who've been through or not been through um, like the some one of one of the most important pieces of the seven steps and the 37 fundamentals program there there's crossover right 
there's this eight aspect framework. And the first thing we're going to do is divide that into the Sanmitsu because those eight all fit into the three. Mikyo condenses things, right? Doesn't make them go away. It condenses them. And then by looking at those, we'll be able to go, well, shit, that part of it's conscious. That part of it, it could be conscious, unconscious. That part of it's a driver. That part of it's an intensity to what degree, right? But this one over here is all subconscious. Hmm. Now what? Well, some of that we're going to have to hone to get better. Some of that we're going to have to be aware of so we can use it more effectively. Some of that we're going to have to do other things to force our belief system, our viewpoint, whatever about things that we don't even know is driving to the surface. It's kind of like fishing. So we can grab that thing and either understand it better, which means we'll understand ourselves better and our own motivations. We will be able to replace it if it's not serving us, if it's wrong, right? Or we'll be able to tweak it to get it more into alignment with ultimate truth, right? So um, that, that's a major issue. And for anybody that's going to be getting into that Goshimbo psychological self-defense program, that's got to be ironed out. So by her asking me that question, not only you know is Aaron going to get her uh, question answered, but my goal is to fix this one piece of misunderstanding or misinformation or misassumption that a lot of people might have that no matter how earnestly they jump on a practice without this little piece of information, it's not going to work for them or it's not going to work to the degree it should. Because ultimately everything comes from the inside out, regardless of the avenue. So that, that's got to be put into alignment first before we try to produce results out there, right? So, but remember in the beginning I said, I'm explaining this from a Mikio perspective for Sensei Reinhardt because of her question, but I want you to think about this from the perspective of your techniques. Okay. What should be going on on the inside? Because all of our techniques are built on thought, word, and deed as well. Okay. We just happen to call them intent, strategy, and or tactics, right? Um, but tactics are a bridge. And action. Okay. So... We're only doing things step by step, and that's what we understand. What drives that? What are inner workings in the body based on the situation, based on the uh, attacker, based on the type of attack, based on anybody that I might be responsible for protecting in the moment, uh, based on any rules or whatever that I may be subject to, right? Right talking to my Leos, I'm talking to, well, even everybody, everybody that's just, they're not law enforcement, they're not military, you don't have rules of engagement, you don't have use of force rules. Yeah, you do, okay? It's called the self-defense doctrine or whatever that translates to in whatever area of the world you're in, right? Step outside of that, you go to jail, okay? Don't train well enough, you go to the morgue, right? So, uh, it's kind of like in the Bible, right? The wages of sin are death. Okay? Well, sin was an archer's term, and it meant missing your mark. Okay. The Romans knew what they were talking about. Okay. So, miss your mark often enough, or miss your mark uh, by not training properly, miss your mark by um, not understanding something, and that affects your training, whatever, right? Misread the opponent. Uh, the wages of sin are death. Uh, 
And it may not have happened in the 50 fights you've been in up to this point, but just because it hasn't, you know, that, that logic that some people have, right. You, you give them a cautionary warning and they go, well, if it hasn't happened yet, it's not going to happen. Really interesting. Your ESP is so good, dude. I wouldn't even worry about learning anything else, right? Just whatever you feel it's, is right, whatever you assume to be right, right? Your ESP, but then if your ESP was that good, why the hell do you have all the problems you have? You should already know how it's going to work out. You should already know the right thing to say, the right thing to think, the right thing to do, right? You should already be engaged in the right livelihood, right? You should, okay? See, BS, right? Ego and its belief system. See, you thought I was going to say bullshit. Anyway, but a lot of book belief systems are bullshit. <laughs> or at the very least, they're imbued by a certain type of bullshit, right? Which is what we're trying to ferret out in this other stuff, right? So anyway. Um, all right, James, questions, comments before we wrap this up? <clears throat> Victor jumped on, said good evening. Hope he didn't hurt himself. Uh, he said, one problem I see is unclear expectations. Self-defense is not necessarily the same as a protector. Competition is not the same as surviving. Did anybody see the the text I put out? Oh, it was something I shared, actually. Um, it might have only gone on the dojo thing. I tried to fix it on the other ones that I shared. I might have to share it again uh, because my my write-up got shared, but the video link didn't get shared. So if you go to Warrior Concepts Black Belt and Life Mastery Academy on Facebook, um, scroll down a little bit, you'll see it. But there's this person at a gas pump pumping gas, and this freaking panel van pulls up, and three or four jack wagons come out to attack them. One runs around the vehicle, whatever, right? And they immediately pull that, that nozzle out hit it on full bore and start hosing these guys down in the face, shoot it inside the vehicle, all that. Well, they're now dred you know, drenched in, in gas, petrol, whatever, right? Jump back in the van. Probably not a good idea, but, <laughs> but they drove off, right? And uh, it kind of ends there, but my assumption is they put the thing back in and, and finished filling it up, or you know, I would have been done for the day and left because I could always top my gas tank off later. But my point was not all self-defense is about fighting, right? It's not that they didn't counter, but there's way more options. Can you imagine a UFC fight? Somebody brings a, a tank and a compressor, right? One's full of gas. One's just pumping air in and all that. So when they bow in or they bump gloves or whatever, this guy reaches over, grabs a nozzle, and just hoses his partner down. Uh, or hoses, hoses his uh, opponent down or whatever, you're not going to see shit like that, right? And this is where people, again, if you if you read the comments under my videos, yeah, even the shitty ones, you know, someone piss me off, someone make me smile or whatever, but um, what pisses me off is the ignorance. Sometimes it's the disrespect. Not that I'm deserving of respect as in like I'm something special, but from a warrior's perspective, they are attacking and being disrespectful for, towards somebody that they're making assumptions about and don't know anything about. And one of these days they're going to do it and somebody's going to show up at their door and shoot them in the face. Right. They think that they're protected by anonymity in their attempt to want to, be somebody or have their voice heard, but they need to crawl out of their parents' basement and dust themselves off and step into the light a little bit. But anyway, um, if you read them, you can immediately see what some of their beliefs, their views, and all these things are all these things are driven by subconscious and unconscious things 
right? And some of those, like Victor pointed out, assumptions and expectations, okay? They're expecting that every situation, every fight, every attack situation or whatever is just that, right? It's in a fight. Every fight I've ever gotten into. See, I don't see them as fights. I see them as self-protection situations. And unless I'm willing to go to the morgue or you know, whatever, go to jail for acting in this moment, hmm, because if that, the, one of those two things happen, I can't protect the people that I've decided are worth my protection. So, yeah, no. Okay? But what they don't understand that's not a part of that little subconscious, unconscious thing that's going on is they don't realize how lucky they have been that all the fights were fist fights. Nobody grabbed them because they're still not prepared for them. A lot of them, right? I can't remember ever grabbing somebody or being grabbed in a fight. Well, that's because you've been lucky enough to get into people who fight just like you, right? But what about the guy who starts losing and pulls a gun or a knife or grabs a freaking club or something that's laying on the ground or a rock, smacks your ass in the head and sends you off to the emergency room or the morgue or whatever, right? So um, they think like teenagers, right? They've had a couple of experiences and they make assumptions that they project forward with. And so their belief system is it's either always like it is in the ring or it's always like it has been or whatever. Okay. So instead of learning from things and what about the, uh, the unspoken needs that they have based on their personality type and based on their maturity level and whatnot, that they don't go on. They, they tell themselves they're going on to learn. I want to learn this, right? Let's click on that. Oh, that, why would they click on the title? Because it sounds like something that interests them. How to do this, how to do that. But what do they do with most of their time? They knock the stuff because it doesn't match what they do. They're only looking for stuff that shows them how to do what they already do faster, stronger, or better. And they knock everything else. Okay. And then you can see other people commenting. They're like, uh, no, that works really well. You obviously have never seen these fighters do this in the ring or out. You've never been whatever. These things happen all the time. Right. So they don't want to listen to them because they're too busy knocking. But click on a couple of names, go to their YouTube profile. What you see is no picture. Right. So they can hide behind anonymity. And you see no videos. Every once in a while, you'll see a comment from me that asks where I can go to look at their video so I can learn it the right way. And then what they do is they swear at me or you know, whatever. Showing my secrets. You don't have to show your secrets. You just told me that you know everybody knows how a fight is done. So I put on gloves and dot, dot, dot. So I, I, what would I see? I'd see the same thing that everybody else is doing. You'd just be using your words either way right so um but this the, all this right the physical the psychological and all this right if we're gonna when, when people mention right kudos to you for putting up with the shit and all that kind of stuff right it's it's these practices and understandings that i got from miko teacher who sounded an awful lot like it's okay. Sometimes the words were different, but the meaning was exactly the same. But what I did was I set up a situation where I can get to the middle faster because I'm burning my candles at both end, both ends. Okay. So, and I was taught very early on that this art is about learning and doing anything that could produce results faster, easier, less effort, less wear and tear in the process. Anything. This is not 
like the quote unquote samurai perspective, which is if it was good enough for great grandpappy and grandpappy and dad, then I'm just going to keep doing that thing. Great. Well, you know, they invented indoor plumbing, indoor toilets, but you're still going to an outhouse and getting splinters in your ass. Right? That's not a literal thing. Well, I hope not anyway, but I'm sure somewhere somebody has gone, you know what? As a matter of fact, I don't know if you guys have heard this story or not, but my stepdad, um, for all the negative things that he taught me how to not do, uh, he taught me the power of the will and he taught me about the power of this type of thinking. When he was, I think he was 32, that name, uh, that number sticks in there because I think some, a bunch of friends and stuff were like, are you nuts? You're only right, 32, right? At 32, he decided, and it was the last time he ever went to a dentist, went to a dentist and had all of his teeth pulled out. He did it in two, two visits, one for the bottoms and one for the tops, right? And I remember sitting in the living room on the floor trying to watch TV. And I kept peeking over my shoulder because he was sitting in his easy chair with a bucket next to him. And he was throwing up because of all the pain, bleeding, right? Choking on it, that kind of stuff, right? And I remember, like, I remember asking and I remember other people asking, right? Man, were your teeth that bad? Nope, they were perfectly fine. Why the hell would you have all of your teeth pulled out? Well, so I could get dentures. Why the hell would you want to get dentures? Well, if it's good, my family's always had dentures. If it was good enough for my great grandfather, it was great good for my grandfather, and both of my parents had dentures. I just figured I'd get get ahead of it instead of losing one tooth at a time. But your teeth were healthy. Your teeth were fine. Okay. Now, that's just an example. It's a pretty extreme example, but how much do we do this to ourselves on a regular basis? And maybe it wasn't a family line. Maybe it was this teacher, that university professor, that manager at work, that NCO uh, in the military, that best friend's dad, who, whatever. Right? So... Anyway, um, anything else? Uh, just a comment from Dave. That is reason it is important to not practice lethal solutions without care. It can come out before the thought maybe where it is not legitimate. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, well, a lot of things can turn into lethal things because uh, people believe that Sparring always has to be at full intensity. Uh, training has to be fast and hard. I, I remember that being thought way back in the day uh, in this art because all of us came from other martial arts and whatnot. But the training gear doesn't protect you against the things that we do. Just like with kendo, right? Um, you're, uh, is it kendo? Yeah. You're, you're smacking armor, right? Um, you can't smack the areas that we would go after with a sword because there's no armor there. Well, that's counterintuitive. Then this can't really be about sword fighting. What is it, right? Kendo is about uh, refinement of the spirit. A lot of companies would send their uh, up-and-coming executives to things like this so that they would learn to be hard chargers right into uh, adversity, right? And keep going even when the going was rough or even when there was a lot of resistance and whatever, right? It's about spirit, right? It's not about Kenjutsu or it's not about, yeah, it's not about Kenjutsu, Kendo, different, right? So, uh, what the hell was I going with that? Uh, oh, the, the lethal stuff, right? So, Way back, 
uh, people coming into us, uh, we're doing slow training. And the number of students that would quit or would at least verbalize it, and that was in my teacher's dojo, and also uh, when people when I started my first training group, and you know along the way, right? So I've learned to explain this and and preframe reframe things because there's this belief that if you don't do it full, if you don't learn it at full speed, you won't be able to do it correctly at full speed. Except that one, your memory and your your wiring doesn't work that way. You're going to be as fast as you can be, and you're going to be as uh, strong as you can be under the adrenal response. You're you're going to be there already, right? Um, the learning process, the mechanism, accuracy, and and timing and distancing and things like that. Um, are what needs to be ingrained because again you're going to be as fast as you can be or you're going to be as strong as you can be right um it, it's it's independent right because you need to wire the muscles for the for the action for the timing those kind of things because again under the adrenal response the muscles are going to fire as fast as they can fire right but we would lose people because of this belief but the people that did that you know, needed to do it fast, needed to do it hard, needed to, they were breaking people, they were getting hurt themselves, all that kind of stuff, which is why Hatsumi Sensei subtly changed things along the way because of this misunderstanding and it was putting a blemish on the Bujinkan, on the art, on the lineage, right? So, but um, it's not just that, you know, you need guidance when moving into those realms. Right? I just did what two two whiteboard Wednesdays back to back on Rondori and spontaneous response. And no, I, I guess I did, I did one, but my senior people did two classes back to back that worked those from different directions, mm -hmm. right? Different types of training drills, different focus. Um, but. Um, <laughs> not understanding and not taking care can turn something into a critical situation pretty freaking quickly. You know, a broken rib, stabbing into an organ, somebody will bleed to death before they even realize they're that injured. Not just, wasn't just a good punch. Right. Anyway. All right. Anything else? Uh, just Jared jumped in and said good evening. Hey, Jared. Jared just upgraded to mod two. Welcome aboard for that one. Awesome. Now you get to think about strategies and tactics and maneuvering and drawing somebody out and making them expose their targets. So your job at dropping them is easier. Anyway, what else you got? That was it. That was it. All right. Cool beans. All right. Well, another brick in the wall, I guess. Um, Hopefully that was helpful in some way. Um, for those of you who have been going through the modules or looking for something that, I don't know, didn't look like mod one had for you or didn't look like mod two had for you or whatever, um, we will be starting up uh, with mod three here soon. Um, probably not within the next week. So two, maybe three weeks out. Uh, I've got to get a whole bunch of stuff, all the working parts in the back done and then we'll get all that stuff fired up so uh, watch your emails for just training perspectives and things that'll lead up to that and allude to uh, what we'll be doing in that program but uh, for those of you who missed it uh, we started uh, restructuring and what we're doing is relaunching some stuff that's already in place but um, when did I do those, James? 15, 16 years ago, give or take? Um, something like that. Maybe longer. Who knows? Uh, but it was time based on what I know now and teaching perspectives. And the, so the layout of it's different. We're using new technology, all kinds of cool stuff. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there was over 150 lessons in each module. 
So, and I'd see, there's an overwhelm thing too. How do I, well, see, it all ties back together because we give it to you in three phases. So we start off with do these things this way, get the flow, the timing, the angling, that kind of stuff in at phase two. And then, okay, you should have those. So here's some variations. Here's some other ways to do the same thing. Um, so it literally takes somebody through and the prioritization is already there, right? The, um, the focus, the what's important now is already there. Uh, and then it's divided between uh, uh, one set of videos come out during one part of the week that are techniques on another day of the week, uh, skills that either make up those or will be general across the whole uh, not just the module you're working on, but will enhance everything learned before it and will be necessary for things moving forward. And then there's what we call personal development lessons that come out. That's typically on Friday, right? Sometimes it's not the weekend, but uh, depends on all kinds of extra schedules that are going on. But, um, but personal development, sometimes it's actual personal development and the philosophical teachings and whatnot. And other times it's just breaking the whole self-defense paradigm down and um, strategic thinking and really like pulling tactics out of the week, out of those lessons and highlighting them. So the stuff that is not readily able to be seen in the physical two-dimensional videos, right? We go into that and look at it uh, because if if you don't get that lesson and change the way you think about it or change the way you look at things or change the way uh, or understand the way you're manipulating and controlling the bubble in the situation, then no matter how much you learn the step by steps of the techniques and or the skills, they're still not going to be needed to. They're still not going to be right. Okay, They'll be right at a level where it'll be as good as you can make it, but it's you're missing the magic. It's like having a vehicle and putting the wrong fuel in it. Okay. Well, the last car I had, you know, took this kind of fuel. Yeah. Okay. Except now you have a diesel. So good luck with that. Okay. Or you had a diesel and now you've got gas, petrol, right? Engines are designed to burn a specific type of fuel techniques, same way. Right. And then we also look at it from the different perspectives of this particular system or this particular attack or the size of the attacker or the situation or scenario you're in requires a certain type of strategy. Could be holding your ground and stopping this guy's tracks, could be creating distance and sucking him out, which is our mod two kind of thing, right? That breaks his strength, breaks his speed, slows him down and allows you to just pick him off as he's coming in. Mod three is just the opposite, right? This situation requires that I get the hell in there and get in there quick. But see, each one of these, each one of these could be a standalone and they are because the martial arts world has examples of each one of these modules, but it needs to they're all there because the situation dictates the, the strategic, tactical, and technique uh, choices, unless all you have is one style, so that's all you got. Okay, So instead of being a one-hit wonder, we're going to be like a general that has multiple divisions. This division does this thing. This division does this thing. These special forces guys over here? Yeah, they get inside his defenses before he even knows you're in there, right? That kind of thing, right? Again, it all goes back to Sun Tzu's Art of War and these other things too. So anyway, all right, uh, we've been at this for an hour. So uh, watch for some emails, watch for uh, you know, there's more training opportunities coming up. So uh, if you're interested, great. If not, no harm, no foul. But either way, uh, I'll see you next time on Kuden. Get more of Kuden Radio, subscribe through your favorite podcasting site, or join our clan of serious modern warriors at OnlineNinjaAcademy.com.